Um, it was a childhood dream of mine since the age of six. So ever since I was a little boy, I always wanted to become a killer whale trainer since first seeing that the very first Shamu Stadium show at SeaWorld of Florida in 1980. And um, I just focused on that, you know, growing up. And that was my sole focus of what I wanted to do. And I began my career at SeaWorld of San Antonio in 1993, right when I turned 20. And I spent most of my career at SeaWorld of California. And then I spent also um, two years of my career as a supervisor of killer whale training at Marineland and Antibes. Resigned my position August 17th of 2012, and um, a lot of things had happened all at once. I had been disenchanted with SeaWorld, uh, the, the culture of SeaWorld, the corporate greed and exploitation of both the trainers and whales for a long time, for many years, and had battled it. But a lot of things happened in a very short amount of time that really just killed it for me at the end. And... Um, you know, one of them, I, well, first I was injured in the water with Takara. Um, it wasn't an aggressive incident. I, my foot slipped off her rostrum on a stand on spy hop and I broke my ribs. And um, it took a month to recover from that. And as soon as I came back from that injury, which was a pretty nasty one, um, Keto killed Alexis Martinez in, in Spain at Laura Parquet. And of course, SeaWorld. Uh, owns Keto. I used to work with Keto when Keto was in the California park actually. Um, and um, so of course that was horrific when it happened, although most people were never aware of it, that that happened until after Don was killed 60 days later by Tilikum. And you know, and both of them died very violent ways. It bothers me when I would hear in the press, read in the press that they were drowned or it was an accident. You know, um, Clearly, Don was dismembered, and Alexis was crushed. So uh, these were not just accidents; these weren't just drownings. And so after that, um, then they blamed them. They blamed the deaths of Alexis on him, his mistakes, his uh, relative inexperience, as it was explained, and then also Don for putting herself in too vulnerable of a position and being complacent were their exact words. And then the final straw for me was how they testified in court. Te Sewell testified in court that they had no knowledge we had a dangerous job. And once they said that in court, something inside me just really died. It's interesting because, um, you know, it's, it takes a while uh, of being a trainer before, because when you're there, you know nothing and you're learning on the job. And as a lower ranked trainer, you spend time at Dolphins, even if you go to Shamu Stadium later, you'll spend time at either Dolphin or at Sea Lion. So when I was a, a younger, lower level ranked trainer, and in the beginning I was at Sea Lion Stadium, and the first harmful effects that I would see would be the, um, the horrible arthritis with the Sea Lions, and also, and the, and the uh, walruses, and also that they all went blind. All of the sea lions went blind, all of the walruses went blind. And originally, in my naivety and being so young and not knowing anything, I just thought that that was normal, that was just old age. But when you look at it, you understand, as you gain more experience and more perspective, they're living a life on concrete. And we're, we're training them to be in unnatural body positions that are putting, and look at the weight of these animals and the, uh, that we're asking them to put on their hips and their spines and all that. So. That was my first realization was really at Sea Lion and then later, years later, at, at uh, Killer Whale. Um, again, you get there and you think, I don't know, maybe the dorsal fins really are like this, the collapsed dorsal fins in the wild because we were always told uh, and we told the public that the exact stat we gave, we gave was 23% of all photographed Killer Whales in the wild have a collapsed dorsal fin. Well, of course, it's completely false. Um, and then, of course, the teeth issues, the massive teeth issues. When you're younger and you're just getting there, you don't know if killer whales in the wild have teeth like that and, you know, would need to have drilling in the dental care and you're just unable to give it to them in the sea. But then you realize that they're not like that in the wild. This is a product of them being in captivity, wearing down their teeth excessively because they live such boring lives because their environment is so horrifically sterile.
so many of the whales were uh, on medications and um, several of the whales that I worked with in my career were on medication every single day of their life. They were never not on medication. So it was a part of our everyday uh, process that um, someone went down to the lab and picked up the medications for the whales. So just, um, and there's such a laundry list of meds I can give you, but just some, just some examples. Um, Splash, who's now, who's now dead, um, he was on phenobarbital because he was believed to be uh, epileptic because he would seizure. Uh, interesting about that is even though he would seizure and we he was on phenobarbital every day we still swam with him even though he would seizure um, so also uh, we have we had a whale named uh, and she's still alive her name's Una we would put her on a medication called Itra to control because we couldn't control the fungal spores that would develop in her urine uh, which would reflect that she had a, an infection in her reproductive tract and we never could get control of it or figure out why and, or how to stop it so she lived every single day on ITRA to control it and then um, uh, clindamycin is a broad spectrum antibiotic the whales are regularly treated with that because either they've been in a fight with other whales and they're very badly raked up uh, or just in regular blood work we would see an elevated white blood cell count that reflected uh, that they had an infection somewhere in their body that we didn't identify. Just um, oh, and, and Regimate we use it. We use Regimate on Una to try to prevent her from being pregnant. And Regimate is so strong uh, that only us male trainers were allowed to inject it into the fish because if a female trainer got uh, contact, it she could become sterile. So only male trainers were allowed to inject it. We had to wear gloves. We had to feed it to Una, and then we had to bleach everything because the medication was so strong so we, she was on that for a, a, for a long time as well we we always believed and i still believe um and it was always discussed as this though that the whales had ulcers from stress and most people the same thing with people i mean usually if you go to the doctor and you're having ulcers your stress level you're having chronic stress and um, I believe it's a, it's a no-brainer to just see that they're living in these horrifically sterile environments and confinement and in unnatural social pairings, being stripped from their family units that obviously their stress levels are very high. And so we would put them on tagament. And um, it, tagament was, if it wasn't an everyday drug that we used uh, on some of the whales, it was so often used it was just commonplace to try to control the ulcers so because so many of the whales had it great question um growing up in the in that system and being a sea world trainer uh it's a very elitist mindset we are um programmed I like to use that word because I really do believe that that's what it is we're programmed to uh, believe that we are the only ones in the world that know how to handle killer whales or know about killer whale biology killer whale behavior that we are the experts um, our top managers in the company that are still in place uh, like Mike Scarpuzzi VP of zoological in, in California has gone on camera and media and said, you know, challenging the federal government saying, we are the experts. You know, we, we are the ones that know these whales, not, not the OSHA investigator, but we are the experts. So um, I, w I was conditioned my entire career that all of these other types of experts, Ingrid Visser, Howard Garrett, Naomi Rose, Rick O'Berry, um, that these were crazy people to be ignored to be completely ignored and not to give any of their uh, research even a second thought. And, um, and that's what we all did. We just completely ignored it. Sure, I think um, one of the worst uh, uh, species, or I should say one of the species that, that fares worst in captivity is 
are beluga whales. When you look at the, the death rates of captive beluga, whale, beluga whales, it's astonishing. It's, it's actually um, scary to see how many belugas die in captivity and how quickly they die. The fact that any place in the world still has beluga whales in captivity is an atrocity. Um, and, um, you know, dolphins, of course, we all know killer whales are the largest members of the dolphin family. And so all of the types of issues and problems associated with killer whales, um, obviously dolphins, bottlenose dolphins, specific white-sided dolphins, I mean, they're suffering the same type of damage. Of course, orcas, because of their size, they need even more. So I think it's a more of a pressing issue, but you still see those same issues with those other animals. Um, I don't believe that there, we should have um, captive breeding for conservation because we don't need it. <laughs> so, uh, for example, um, SeaWorld has never released a single killer whale out in the wild. They've never reintroduced a killer whale into the wild, and they never will. They have no plans to, and I can promise you they never will. Um, and now all the killer whales are um, increasingly inbred, and um, now we have crossed ecotypes. And so whales that would naturally in the wild never breed. Now they're forced to breed because they're in the same confined space. And now they've produced hybrid whales that don't exist in the wild. So we couldn't put these whales back into the wild because they have no social identity. They're, they don't exist in their natural habitat. And if we, it would be very irresponsible to, to put inbred whales um, back into the wild or whales that have now are, are hybrid animals and that's that's what SeaWorld classifies as a successful breeding program when that's not a successful breeding program that's an abomination when you inbreed animals and you crossbreed animals that have no social identity uh, how can you call that a success or a successful program it clearly is not Um, it, well, it's false. One, it's false. And under the Marine Mammal Protection Act of 1972, that's the condition of, of um, being able to keep these animals in captivity is there is supposed to be some type of educational component. But I can tell you for doing shows for 14 years over a 19 year period, there is no education content in those shows. It was so embarrassing, in fact, um, for me personally, uh, the last three and a half years of my career, um, I was embarrassed to do those shows because they even had us out there da doing dance steps, learning choreography and dancing and having the whales even dance to choreographed music by pop music. Jennifer Lopez, what a nothing against Jennifer Lopez, she may have great music. I just don't believe it belongs in killer whale shows. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's, you know, and in the ridiculous sequined uh, wetsuits with us dancing around. I mean, there's just, there's no dignity in that type of show. And this should be a show where you're supposedly educating the public about this amazing apex predator, one of the most amazing animals on the planet, and you're having them dance to pop music. Where is the education content in that? Or jumping up and touching, they still do this to this day, jumping up and touching a plastic ball. I mean, this is not the 1970s or 1980s anymore. Yes, I have. Um, well, I've worked with many whales that have died um, because unfortunately they live um, very short life lifespans in captivity. So um, some of them died, you know, I'd, I had worked with them and then I'd maybe gone to another park, whether I moved from California to Texas or vice versa or gone to France and then a whale I had worked and swam with died later. But also when I, I came back to SeaWorld of Texas in 2008, um, Halen was only two and a half years old and she died only a couple of months after I came back. So I was actually one of the people trying to save her and she was so disoriented, she, she essentially drowned and we were trying to get her into the med pool and we were trying to lift the med pool, but when we would lift her, she would hold her breath 
and she wouldn't breathe. But when we would lower her so she would breathe, she, she didn't have control motor skills and she would, she would drown. She would be lift, listing to the side and she ultimately drowned. So I saw that and it was you know, horrible, I think, you know, especially she was so young and she had been taken from her mother. Um, she had no mother at two and a half, so very sad to say. And I think to, to see an animal that that is their environment, that that's their world, the ocean and uh, water, and to see that type of animal drown, for me, was even more disturbing. You know, a lot of times the vets would withhold information like that from us. So an animal would die, they would come, they would crane the animals out of the pool, a necropsy would be performed, we would wait for toxicology. Um, but I can tell you just some of the examples, and these are uh, some of the, I think, the most horrific examples. We've had two killowells die from mosquito transmitted encephalitis. And so from mosquito bites, so d a disease that a mosquito, a simple mosquito is carrying from biting these killer whales. That would never happen in the wild, but in captivity it happens because they're resting for abnormally lengths of, lengths of time at the surface of the water. And these mosquitoes, especially in central Florida and central Texas, are just on their back and biting them. So we've lost two killer whales that way. Um, another, uh, I think, a, a, I say a great example, but a great example to show how captivity is not what people think it is, is Splash. You know, SeaWorld would like you to think that they live in these pristine environments, these pools that are you, no pollution, pollution free and beautiful and, uh, you know, no dangers that they would have in the wild. They like to use that word instead of natural habitat. And um, our filtration system at SeaWorld of California failed. Uh, backed up and failed, backed up in some way, whatever way you want to classify it. And the filtration sand, which is just one of the ways they used to treat the water, uh, would backflow into the pool. Well, Splash, because he was so bored, he would sit down at that inflow and he would suck in the filtration sand. So when he died, he died with hundreds, they found hundreds of pounds of filtration sand in all of the chambers of his stomach. I have. I've had a lot. Um, I say a lot. I've had. I've had approximately ten, and almost all of those, and maybe all of those, were at uh, Marineland, and on Teep, because um, when I went there too, um, those whales had never had trainers in the water with them before, and we were training myself and another sea whale trainer. We were training those whales on water work for the first time, so we knew we were going to have aggressions with that learning curve as you're teaching those whales what's acceptable and what's not in the water. But I also had a couple um, at SeaWorld as well. You know, it's never a great or fun experience when that happens um, and you try to get through it um, the best you can and as quickly as you can and turn it around into a positive but I've been in aggressive situations where whales have grabbed me in their mouth and held me under um, more than once um, a lot of times by the feet uh, a lot of aggressions happen when whales grab you by your feet a lot of times they're trying to get the sock off your foot we've had those types of aggressions um, but I've also been hit in the back aggressively by killer whales where it was believed that my back actually was fractured luckily it was not but uh, and then I had a, a whole host of other um, health related injuries just from the nature of the job swimming with killer whales for so many years that were not necessarily aggressive uh, you know related to aggression they were just from doing swimming with killer whales being 180 pounds swimming with an 8,000 pound killer whale A lot of problems with Marineland on TV, I think the main um, source of it was they just simply did not have the financial resources that SeaWorld did. And not to say that, um, okay, SeaWorld has the financial resources, so there are no problems. There are clearly problems with SeaWorld, but I think it's magnified um, at Marineland on TV because they didn't have the money. For example, some of the major ones were they didn't have enough money for a chilling system for the water. 
um, or a powerful enough filtration system. So at SeaWorld, we were always told that our, uh, and you know, Florida, California, Texas are slightly different in size, but say roughly five million gallons, that, that all that water would turn over on average every five to six hours. At Marineland and on Teeb, that water wouldn't turn over for seven days. That's what we were told. So basically you're having water that's not moving and it's just stagnant. And on top of that, with no chilling system, in the winter, the water would be um, an acceptable temperature. But in the summer, it was so hot that we would actually have algae, just free sitting algae on the top, so all the bacteria and everything. And we would have, uh, me personally, you know, skin conditions and fungal uh, infections that would take, uh, you know, oral antibiotics and topical antibiotics just to clear it up just because the water was so, you know, I had so much bacteria in it, which is clearly, you know, terrible for the animals. Yeah, definitely there's a relationship between uh, Lower Parque and SeaWorld, and um, I guess SeaWorld, especially after the death of Alexis Martinez, would love for people to think that there's not. So all of the killer whales are owned by SeaWorld, and we were always told that um, they, they always had to abide by our guidelines, uh, and if they didn't, and our standards at SeaWorld, we would pull those whales back from Spain at any time. And, and then when we were still swimming and doing water work before, um, and of course Lord Parque stopped after Alexis was killed, there always had to be a SeaWorld supervisor there at all times for every killer whale interaction, every killer whale water work session. Now after Alexis was killed, we stopped sending a SeaWorld supervisor over there. Well, this is where I've, is a, a growth um, a opportunity for me because um, definitely for public swimming with the dolphins for fun and for entertainment, uh, you know, I've never agreed with that. I don't. You know, I think it's gross. Um, but the um, dolphin-assisted therapy programs, um, I had to be educated about that myself, even in the last year, because I thought, well, okay. Maybe if, you know, if this is maybe uh, a stepping stone to get these animals into a sanctuary and a better life, but they need to raise money and it's dolphin assisted therapy and it's, be, it's therapeutic for a child that needs it, maybe this is an acceptable um, way. But as I have become more educated by people who have given me that education, I am definitely against that. I do not believe that that is a, a, a viable option, and we should not do it. Just giving people more of the truth. I think that people, it's such a closed off, secretive world, what we do. Um, um, very few people have access to that world. And, you know, um, what, what is it like to be a killer whale trainer? What is it like to be a killer whale trainer at SeaWorld? It's very secretive, it's very closed off. And it's only recently a little bit been opened because of the death of Don and then Alexis, but it's still very closed off. So I just felt like I had a lot to contribute because I was there for 14 years over a 19 year period and I wanted to just tell people just very honestly and factually what happened during my career, all the high points, all the low points, and so they could just see for themselves. And then also to see my evolution of how I, I was once a 100% SeaWorld loyalist. I believed in SeaWorld. I supported SeaWorld completely. I fiercely defended them. But how I grew because of what I saw with the animals, because I wasn't there because I love SeaWorld. I was there because I love the whales. So as I, I grew as a trainer and I saw all these horrible things happening to these animals that I loved that shifted the way I thought and I believe that's why now I have a responsibility to those whales that I love. My responsibility is not to SeaWorld. My responsibility are to the whales who gave me so much is to give people the truth.